So, hello everybody. My name is Nyanako. Uh, if you went to Abayagiri, my home monastery in California, you would hear people calling me Ajahn Nyanako. Ajahn is a word that just comes from the Pali word Acharya, which means teacher. Over 10 years as a bhikkhu, as a Buddhist monk, you get the term teacher, whether you teach or not. You're called Ajahn. This is Tan Yasa. Tan is venerable in the Thai. So, uh, so we've got Ajahn and Tan, those are Thai words, but we're both bhikkhus, we both follow the same set of rules, and... Sorry, yeah. I'm seeing that the lavender isn't attached. Oh. oh. Hopefully uh, you can still hear me. Is this, is this just for the live stream, this? Okay. The live stream didn't hear that first part, never mind. So, so in Abayagiri, you would call me Ajahn Yanako and Tanyasa, but uh, for, for here, especially if people are new to monasticism or Buddhism, I can also just be called Nyanako and Yasa. We don't need the honorifics. That's also totally okay. And we won't hold it against you or go quiet and be internally upset and passive aggressive. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, I just, um, I'm the abbot of the monastery, have been for three years now, and uh, I've been there for 20 years. It's 20 years ago that I went to Abayagiri, that I uh, wandered off, wandered off the street into Abayagiri as a stoned out surfer, and who would have thought I would be the abbot of one of the most prestigious training monasteries in the world, and just uh, never would have imagined. Um, but uh, I just have so much gratitude for Abayagiri and for just the teachings I've received there and what I've, and just what we're a part of. Also, we're a part of a worldwide community. I've, I've spent, I've lived in Thailand for six and a half of the past 20 years. So I've had the opportunity to live at our monasteries in Thailand. I've, I've spent time at Ajahn Chah's main monastery, Wat Pa Pong, spent five months there and I've also had the opportunities to spend time in retreat in Thailand and living at very remote monasteries and going alms round. We, we rely, we have these bowls on, uh, we rely on alms food. So I've, I've gone alms round in extremely poor villages and relied on alms, alms food. I lived in one place called Pujam Gam. I lived there for two and a half years and, and it's a, like a cave monastery and just going for alms food to this incredibly poor village, um, learning a lot from the villagers and connecting with them, learning about their lives and uh, incredibly poor monetarily wise, but incredibly rich in terms of well-being and, and happiness. And I didn't see any, I didn't see depression there in the village. That's one hallmark of this extremely poor village that I lived in was there was, I didn't see anybody who was depressed, which was kind of interesting. And these are just very hardworking farmers and in the Isan, the rural Thailand, the northeast of Thailand. So I got to live in, in those kind of situations in, uh, in the northeast. And I also got to meet really amazing teachers. Like, uh, so like my teacher at Abayagiri, uh, Ajahn Pasano, <coughs> he's been a monk for 47 years. He's my preceptor. He's the one who ordained both of us. Um, He's ordained almost everybody at Abayagiri, but also had the opportunity to spend time and live with Ajahn Liam, who is kind of, he's Ajahn Chah's, you could consider him as Ajahn Chah's Dharma heir, and he's the current abbot of Wat Bapong, and he's been a monk for 57, 58 years now, I think. And he's, uh, so getting to live with him and learn from him is, has been a really great opportunity as seeing what's possible, seeing what's possible in the bhikkhu life. So in terms of uh, what, are we, what are we trying to do with, with practice, then uh, there's this idea that we want to be more spiritual, perhaps uh, looking at what our intention is to come and listen to a talk. And uh, many of you probably know Tan Nisabo, who is a good friend, and he's lived at Abayagiri. I think he was there for a year and a half maybe two years, maybe it was just a year and a half, but he was there for a while. And 
so um, definitely miss having him there. And now he's now he's here in the Pacific Northwest. And he's around. And why do we? What's our intention to meditate? Come and meditate. And that's one. That's one thing that's good to look at. That the if we come to Buddhist practice, or we we gain an interest, or some even a spark of faith in the teaching of the Buddha, and part of us thinks, oh, this is there's something to this. So it's like we're following a scent, and we're kind of wanting to look into it a little bit more. So it gains our there's that sense of interest. But then trying to look at the mind and, and see what's what's actually directing that interest. So the, the mind, the awareness is always getting directed. So in meditation, we learn how to direct the awareness. So everybody here has probably learned about breath meditation before. And they say, watch your breath or, or direct your awareness to the, the breath. Maybe it's the sensation of the, the cool air coming into the nostrils and the warm air coming out. Or you might hold a meditation word like what we do in the Thai forest tradition is is breathing in, mentally reciting but, breathing out, mentally reciting to, that's butto. Butto is the same as buddha, but we say butto meaning we're recollecting the inner Buddha, the, the pure awareness. So that's butto. And that, so however we direct our awareness, we're direct, what we learn how to do in meditation is we learn how to direct our awareness. And a lot of, a lot of what the Buddha is also teaching us how to reframe how to, how to reframe how we're seeing the world. So a lot of times when we come to meditation or to spiritual practice, we might be trying to like figure it out, like we're trying to figure it out, like what's going on in, in the world or in the universe. And the Buddha is reframing it in terms of what can we do to suffer less? What can we do? So even if we were, were to figure it out, the deepest secrets of the universe would that lessen our suffering or not or it might even increase our suffering we might see something we don't want to see so it might increase our suffering and so the buddha is reframing things in terms of okay you don't need to figure everything out all you need to do is practice in a way that you can have more ease and well-being in your life and, and suffer less so that's the buddha said all that he teaches is suffering and the ending of suffering so there's and of course the implications of that are vast, but we can just think about it in those terms for the for the time being. So directing our awareness, how do we how do we direct our awareness and why do we direct our awareness? So when we're meditating, we're directing our awareness to the breath, the breath process. We might also have learned about uh, experiencing the whole body, like body sweeping noticing where there's tension in the body, noticing where there might be pain in the body, and then also consciously calming the body. We may have, we may have um, learned, we may have learned about that as well. And then what we find is we come to meditation and it's then the mind, the mind starts to wander and we start to proliferate about whatever or the mind isn't peaceful, the mind doesn't settle. And so at that point, that's, that's the learning process. So that's learning how we're directing the awareness. So why is the awareness then getting redirected to something else, getting redirected to a thought, getting redirected to a proliferation about the past or a proliferation about the future or hoping for the good food at the meal today or anything. Uh, why is the awareness getting redirected there? So there's something behind the awareness that's actually directing it. So when the awareness gets directed to Bhutto or the breath, there's there's that something behind it. It's the this deep inside we might feel, okay, that's gonna bring some benefit to us. And then the mind maybe doesn't settle right away or doesn't happen fast enough. We don't we don't feel much better or it's just not happening. So then, then deep down inside, there's something in the heart that's saying, mm, "Let's focus on that. That's going to be better." So that's the there's a there's a bit of a misunderstanding happening there, deep down inside. There's a misunderstanding that focusing on this or that thing is going to actually bring us more happiness than say getting back to the breath, focusing on the breath and the body awareness. 
So the way the awareness gets directed, we start to learn about that, that why is the awareness getting directed in various ways? And when we start to investigate like that, we're, we're stepping back. And, or the, we might be meditating and the awareness might go from the meditation object and, and then go off to something else. And then we notice it. We, we notice it at a certain point and we think, oh, I'm such a terrible meditator and, and I don't know how to do this and this is so difficult. And, and then, but then what we don't see is the awareness is then with this self-criticism. So it's habitually going into this self-criticism, self-judgment. And then when we talk about contemplation, that's what it is, is why did the awareness do that? Why did it, why couldn't we just come back to the breath? Why did it go into, you know, you're stupid, you're a bad meditator, you're, you're supposed to be Buddhist and you're not supposed to get angry, you're not supposed to be greedy. Um, the mind is supposed to be pure and bright and they said you're supposed to be blissful and getting into meditative absorptions and it's not happening. And, and so I've got so much defilement, I've got all this defilement and, it's just, and then just give up. I might as well just give up because this isn't, this is too difficult and uh, I'm, I'm worthless and just getting really, uh, it can get really self-critical. But if we step back for a minute, we say, well, that's just, the awareness can get directed in that way as a habit. We have these habits, these habitual tendencies, and that's, that's what we call vipaka or the arising of past kama, past conditions that we've already set in place through our upbringing or what, whatever we've experienced in our lives up to this point, then that's going to arise. We can't stop that from arising. But what we can do is we can, we can curb the momentum of it with the meditation and curb the momentum of, of it by calling into question, well, why, why, why that self-criticism? Why that judgment? Mm -hmm. These things have, they get nourished in certain ways. They get, they get, they get nourished in, in various ways. So say something like, we want to have less anger. So if we want to have less anger, I'll take anger as an example. So anger is nourished by the awareness being unskillfully directed to the negative or, un or directed to focusing on the negative. In a way, we're meditating on it. So like we might, we might have something that's negative and we, we actually focus on it. It's like, why does it have to be that way? It shouldn't be that way. And then that nourishes that nourishes and feeds the anger and aversion in the heart. And it, it, and then it, it's like a downward spiral and it goes, goes on like that. So what we want is if we want, if we have the intention of, we want non anger, or sometimes we may even be anger angry because of other, because of other people's anger. Why do so many people have to be angry? Why does there have to be so much hate in the world? So we might be angry at, other people's anger. So seeing that what the very, very best thing we can do is actually try to nourish that non-anger. And nourishing the non-anger is trying to see the good, trying to see the good qualities in ourselves and others. So this is a new group and I haven't uh, met many of you before, so uh, don't really know what's going to be that helpful to talk about. So I might just open it up for questions now at this point. Maybe having thrown a few seeds out there. Doug. Um, and one thing you might have to do for the live stream is repeat the question or summarize it. Oh, and it was hiding under my robe too. So hopefully, uh, okay. Um, so what's directing the awareness? So there's, there's intention. Um, what's directing intention or is this an infinite regress? The intention is conditioned by the Vipaka. So our, our intentions, we, something I've gotten asked from time to time is, well, what is it with Buddhism? Is it, is it fate or free will? 
what, which one, which one is it? And the answer is it's kind of a combination of both. It's, there is fate in the sense of causes that have been put in place in the past are going to arise as vipaka, as, as kama that arises either in the, in the mind or as a sense of disease or whatever. Kama, also kama in the Buddhist teaching, by the way, is it's the engine that drives the uh, stress and, and suffering um, and happiness because happiness and suffering are two sides of the same coin. But it's the Buddha's pointing towards something transcendent that uh, because the happiness we know is impermanent happiness, it's viparinama dukkha. So it's happiness includes the, 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 dis, the unsatisfactory nature that it changes, it doesn't last. So, but the intention, so, and also the Buddha said kama is intention. So we're creating fresh kama in the present, which is conditioned by the past kama. So our, our present motivations and intentions are conditioned by our past intentions. That's why I say we can't just do a U-turn, but we can curve it. We can curb it. So it's kind of a combination of free will and fate. There's this mysterious aspect of the present where we actually do have the freedom to 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 say okay i if i take responsibility for this i can actually start nourishing the non-anger i can start nourishing the non-greed non-delusion because that's what's directing things in the background is the the three root what the buddha called the three root defilements or the three root poisons in the mind the the greed, hatred, delusion, those are very strong words. So we can think of it as on a subtle level, attraction, aversion, and delusion, or uh, pulling toward, pushing away, and confusion. We can think of it like that, that that's how, that's, that's what our awareness is being directed based on those, those deep intentions, but we can learn how to see that actually that's not helping. Actually that those things in the background, that's actually not helping to lessen our suffering. So there has to be another way. So the other way is what is the Dhamma. And just that's why I'm incredibly grateful that we have the Buddhist teaching, just somebody like the Buddha, a religious seeker 2,600 years ago, who, um, who discovered a another way to actually through through the subtlety and the intuitive wisdom in the practice uh, learning how to nourish uh, non-greed non-anger non-delusion yeah. in brief <laughs> See what's what's when we get into this. Um, see what what's happening here is is that deep in the heart. So we might hear a lot of teachings, but deep in the heart, in our heart of hearts, we don't really believe it. Um, when push comes to shove, we're going to default to certain things, and what we default to, that's where our practice is. So, uh, uh, taking refuge in Buddhism, we talk about taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And what that means on a very deep level is that when there's some really intense difficulty in our life, that's where we go. Um, so, and, and if we want to, we are, we're always taking refuge in something and so when we have a really intense difficulty in our life, where we go, if we see where we go, that's where our refuge is currently. Um, so I can say an example of this is we had a, a guy who was a monk in our community a while back, and he had been a monk for five years. He ordained a bit later in life, and he had been a event from an evangelical Christian family and had left that behind and wanted and gained faith in Buddhism, wanted to be a monk. But then he had a near-death near experience 
um, after his fifth year as a as a bhikkhu, and he had a like a what is that called an embolism, like in his leg where he almost died, and he reverted back. He he went and he disrobed and went back stronger than before to evangelical Christianity. So that's where the refuge, it, deep in the heart, that's where the refuge still was. Um, so like what we're looking at is uh, refuge, uh, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha being awareness, pure, pure awareness, pure knowing, Dhamma being truth and truth of the way things are in the moment, Sangha being virtue, Sangha, Sangha on an external level is the people practicing the Dhamma, but the on an internal level, it's virtue. It's taking refuge in, in actually virtuous moral behavior. Um, we talk about like the five precepts, who pro probably everybody here knows about that. Um, so when we look at refuge, we take we take like a some really difficult situation or or a, an illness or whatever, taking refuge in awareness and looking looking into it, looking into what's the experience, what's the experience of this in the present. Um, and that's the reason we talk about these refuges is these, the Buddha's talking about these refuges as sure and helpful refuges. They're not just, um, they're not just empty and, and meaningless. They actually do help. So awareness actually does help. Um, looking into Dhamma, looking into what, what are, what's the experience in the present? What's the truth of the way things are now? You know, like uh, the body is like this, the mind is like this now. So lo looking into that and then that does end up having an effect on the mind. And that's looking into things that way is, is what we call mindfulness or, or sati. Um, so with, with sati, with mindfulness, that's what actually starts to curb the, the kama in a different direction. But we do have to have that faith and that motivation. We use the word faith. The word faith is sattha in Pali. And it has a, it's not quite the same as like a blind belief. It's an informed faith. It's a, we haven't experienced the fruits of practice yet because we haven't practiced yet. So if we haven't practiced yet, we haven't experienced the fruits, but we've maybe seen examples or read something, read a teacher that we like or a Dhamma book that may have alluded to these fruits of practice and we want to, we have enough confidence that we want to try and see. So the Buddha said, Ehi Pasiko, you know, come and see for oneself that the fruits of the practice are to be seen for oneself. And it's one thing that's kind of kept me with the Buddha's teaching as well is there's this idea that no one's coercing you or forcing you to practice. It's just the Buddha's laying it out there. It's like if you, this leads to suffering, this leads to happiness, this leads to the transcendent and you, you choose. It's kind of, it's completely up to you rather than like, you have to believe this, you have to do that, kind of forcing you. Um, anyway, I digressed. <laughs> <laughs> So, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, not self. When we get to the not self part, I, uh, I think I understand it, and then, then I don't. <laughs> I'm like a five-year-old or somebody that it's explained, mom and dad explained it to me, and then four months later you ask the same question. So I'm asking. <laughs> this question for I don't know how many times, but not self in terms of the ego, in terms of what I understand, uh, I, mine, are illusions, delusions. Um, that, that I'm more of a verb than a noun, if there is an I, it's a, a series of actions. But after I get past that, and ask the question, well, what is it that I'm, my awareness is not myself. What is it? Here's a string of questions. If 
I'm not a self and there's no soul. How does that work with the Buddhist belief in the reincarnation? Uh, so I have some more. Uh, yeah. But yeah. you can please rip on that. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of it is just reframing it actually because it's not necessary to think of what is it. Uh, it's not necessary to think of things in terms of what is it. Not self is a tool for the mind to let, let go, and the Buddha never said no self. Also, and he never said self. So not self is anatta. So that he says the five khandas are not self: the body, feeling, perception, mental formations. Consciousness in terms of awareness, not self. That's anatta. Uh, but he didn't say no self. No self is a different doctrine. And uh, that's called virata. So he said that's, that's actually incorrect to think in terms of no self. It's like no soul, no soul, no self. That's, that's not correct. And also self is not correct. So anatta or not self is is somewhere in the middle and but also it's really those three characteristics it's more like a tool and every person dependent on their temperament will can gain insight through any of the three characteristics it doesn't have to be all three or it doesn't have to be not self um, although if one gains insight into one there will be insight into all three and they're all connected so it could be anicca, which is translated as impermanence, but it also can be translated as uncertainty, or lumpur cha, ajahn cha, like to translate it as not sure. So if we think of things as not sure, we might think so. Anything where we get where we get caught, where the mind isn't peaceful. Um, Know, it's all going to hell in a handbag, and this, this is happening in the world. And uh, not sure. <laughs> if we if we insert not sure, that's a skillful means to help us to come back to the present, reestablish mindfulness. Uh, not self. That's like you know when we might have the thought. Uh, you know when I die, I'm going to hell. I've done so many bad things, and well, no, not self. Uh, the, that's just the body breaking up. It's just the mind breaking up. So the Buddha is saying the body is not self. The mind is not self. If we want to think in terms of what is reborn, what is reborn, the Buddha talks about seeing his past lives back 91 aeons on the night of his awakening. And in, the, in each life I was, you know, I had this and this name, I was part of this and this clan, or I was this and this class of being. He wasn't always human, sometimes even animal or, or celestial beings um, could be transmigrating through all these different realms of existence. So we think, well, the Buddha said, body is not self, mind is not self. So what's being reborn? And, and people did like to ask the Buddha himself this question often. And they would say, well, you talk about you talk about not self, not self, and this being reborn. Like what's what's reborn then? And the Buddha said, you you ask a you ask a deep question about a perplexing matter. It's very it's very subtle and hard to see. So, in terms of not self, yes, all those past lives are not self. So what's reborn? And the Buddha said, it's like a um, it's like you have two candles. So when the body dies. Uh, you have a candle, and the the awareness is the the light, the flame on the candle. And when you when the transmigration between lives, it's like taking one candle and lighting another candle.
way we can actually be grateful for the defilements that we're born and we have this opportunity to practice Dhamma. So what is reborn is, is craving itself, is what is reborn. That's why when craving ends, there's no more rebirth. There can't be more rebirth because there's no, no, there's nothing to be reborn anymore. So is it, what's reborn is craving, but is it the comma that you've added in this life that yeah. gets, that, that's our legacy to the yeah. world? Yeah, and the comma is balled in with the craving. Yeah, yeah. So that's how the comma, the comma continues on. Yeah. So would the Buddha remember however 90 past lives? Yeah, 91 aeons, which is like trillions of past lives. Okay. Is, is he remembering the dukkha that's, that's ongoing, the biological, psychological? Yeah. Yeah, there is, a, and there is a thread there. There's a thread of craving that connects it all together, but that, that can come to an end. But because it's so habitual, we've been, uh, and also, you know, we, we might wonder, like, why don't we remember all our past lives? You know, if there was past lives, obviously, we would remember them. Um, I've asked this question of senior monk in Thailand, and, and uh, he said, well, the, the, the chitta, the heart, or the, the mind has a, has like a, defense mechanism whereby it's it's too traumatic to remember our past death usually and so you actually have to get to a point where you overcome the fear of death and then those things might start to open up a little bit um, but the Buddha also said that when he remembered his past lives he was just remembering past five aggregates past uh, but there's this thread of craving connecting them all together but that he said those past lives were actually not self as well. But it's, it's uh, in, the, in the teaching with the candles, he then says, you know, the, he goes on to say, like, so the, the questioner then says, well, if you say an enlightened being doesn't take birth anymore, what happens then? And the Buddha said, well, it's like blowing out a candle. And and then his questioner says, well, does an enlightened being, does their mind exist after death? And the Buddha says, well, that's not valid. Do they not exist after death? That's not valid. So the, the questioner says, because in Indian philosophy, you don't have the dilemma. You have what's called the quadrilemma. So do they exist and not exist after death? The Buddha says, not valid. And then they say, well, do they neither exist nor not exist after death? And then, <laughs> and then the Buddha says, not valid. And so then the guy says, well, I've, that's every possible possibility. So you must either be just a fool or, or I'm not getting something. And the Buddha says, well, I'll ask you, I'll ask you a series of questions in response to your questions. So when I blow out this candle, uh, he says, did the flame go to the north? And the guy says, not valid. Did it go to the east? He says, not valid. Did it go to the south? Not valid. Did it go to the west? Not valid. And the Buddha says, well, what happened to it? And then the, the guy says, well, it just went out. It's simply classed as out. And the Buddha says, yes, the same. It's the same. The, the, the Tathagata, the, the Buddha, the thus come one has just, he's gone out. He's gone out from suffering, out from rebirth. Out of out of samsara, and then he has these series of verses saying, you know, yes, it's hard to understand, but the the mind of the Buddha is vast and deep, like the great ocean. So it's got this beautiful quality to it as well. Um, so those are definitely difficult questions, and uh, but good to think about. <laughs> Curbing the anger. Uh, 
seeing the anger come, preparing yourself, getting in what headspace, heart space to to be able to curb. Yeah, I I've had to deal with this a lot in my own my own practice, my own monastic life, and um, I remember asking uh, one of our teachers, Ajahn Sona, in in Birkin, Canada, to one of the branch monasteries there. I had this thing about wanting to, I really wanted to overcome my anger. And so I thought of this idea of like, well, you have to be with the anger or be mindful of the anger. So like I would try to be with, be with the anger, you know, not react to it. And I had this idea, but it was very unpleasant. Like, so I'd try to, you know, I'd get angry about something as ha can happen when you live in a community with 30 people in a monastery. And, oh, they did it again. And, uh, get upset, irritated, you know, they didn't follow the rules or they, you know, um, wash the dishes in the wrong way or whatever, then um, kind of getting upset, then trying to be with it, but it, it, it didn't help. It wasn't helping. So I eventually asked Ajahn Sona, I was visiting him one time and I said, so how do you be with the anger? I've got this, you know, mindful, mindful mindfulness of anger. How do you do that? And he said, well, when you're, when you establish mindfulness, you can't be angry. And so I said, well, that can't be the case. <laughs> and uh, so he said, when you think you're being mindful of anger, you're actually generate, you're continuing to generate it somehow. And I didn't believe him. I said, no, that's, that's I'm, maybe I got a little bit angry, a little bit upset. <laughs> It's kind of, yeah, that, that can't be the case. And so, um, but I, I kept turning it over, thinking about it and, and uh, looking at it. And yeah, there's this habit. There's this habit of, even though it's unpleasant, it's, I'm habitually generating it. So, so even, though, even though the anger is very unpleasant and I start feeling depressed and hopeless and I'm going to leave the monastery and all these people to hell with everybody and, and then, but then it actually takes courage. And this is where the word sattha, the word faith comes in in Pali. It also, it also means courage. And you actually have to have courage to not get caught in that, which is, which is causing suffering. So seeing the suffering of it, seeing how unpleasant it is. And yet there's a fear of the unknown. I don't know non-anger. There's a, there's a fear because it's not known. It's not experienced. So, uh, so then having that courage to actually take that leap of faith, it's like you're standing at an edge of a cliff and you know, you know, off that cliff is non-anger, but you're afraid to jump because you don't know what you're going to find at the bottom, but then you actually have to just jump. And so then I could, I could see that Ajahn Sona was 100% right. Like the moment I established mindfulness, anger is just completely gone. It's just, yeah, okay, get upset and kind of you establish that mindfulness in the present, um, establish that mindfulness. Or, or there's a brief moment where you see the anger, but you really see it with mindfulness, and it's then you're back. And there might still be the feelings in the body that anger causes, the chemicals that it makes shoot out of the brain or whatever. Um, you know, and then you watch that kind of dissipate, but the generation of it, the actual thoughts, they, they're just, it can be, you know, stopped right away with mindfulness. So that's why they say mindfulness is like the brakes. It's like putting the brakes on with anger or anything, actually anything that's causing us suffering. But it, what it takes is seeing the suffering of it, seeing the unpleasantness of the anger. So it's like, if I get angry at something or somebody, the only one who's getting harmed is me. You know, I'm not helping them in any way by getting angry at somebody else. You know, I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not helping the situation either. Uh, you know, I'm, there might be like righteous anger, like, you know, that's it. I'm do doing something about it or like, uh, but, uh, but that's, that's immense suffering and that's just going to keep feeding itself. The nature of anger is it, it wants to, on the ultimate level, it wants to destroy, it wants to get rid of. It wants to get rid of 
unpleasant feeling that we're experiencing, but it's compounding it. It's compounding the unpleasantness. So the way out of it is to have that leap of faith, come back to the mindfulness, but seeing the never ending suffering of it, like there's, there's no, with anger, it's, it's leading to more and more suffering. If we act on it, it's leading to suffering for others. You know, we, uh, on the worst possible level, we might even hurt or kill somebody. And so it's suffering for us and for others. And when we see the suffering of it, it's on a very deep level, the heart, the heart won't be able to go there again. Um, but it, it takes, it takes a lot of training. So, uh, you know, it can take, it can take years of trying to kind of turn it around in different ways and, and look at it and, and try it. Sometimes we have to use skillful means um, to really, you know, it can happen too, like with families, like we have these habitual ways of relating to each other that have been built up over the years. And so like, you know, when, when a close friend or family member does something that has always kind of irritated us, but we've always kind of dealt with it in various ways. Maybe we kind of like, you know, repress it or we, we just kind of try to like sweep it under the rug, but it kind of builds up over time and, and we're kind of holding on to it and like, oh, they did it again. And uh, so when we really see the suffering of it though, then it can really break up, it can really break up. And there's that sense of, there's that sense of freedom and expansive awareness, like a lightness, there's a lightness to it. Um, anger is very heavy. Um, for me, I can experience it as like a, this heaviness. It's like you're being, you're being crushed by, by this anger. So it's, it's weird. Like, why do we have it? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so when we see that it doesn't make any sense, then uh, I remember having this experience too, where it was actually in a dream. And it was when I was in Anagarka uh, at Abayagiri when I was first starting out. And of course, really wanting to practice hard. And I didn't want to practice loving kindness practice because metta practice is kind of for beginners. I want to do austerities. I want to, you know, really uh, push hard in the practice and go with little sleep and just uh, meditating all the time and, and getting angry. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so it's like I had this dream that because uh, like me and my sister used to used to bicker and fight when, when we were young. And, and uh, I had this dream where I was having an argument with my sister. And uh, in the dream, I just decided, I just completely let go of it and it like flipped. And I woke up in this state of like bliss. And I had this thought that, wow, if, if everybody knew, if everybody knew that not, that letting go of anger, that that was the result of letting go of anger, nobody would get angry. <laughs> it would just be like, like if you did, if you knew how happy you would be, <laughs> if you just let go of anger, like if you were angry and then you just completely let go of it. And, um, you know, that, even though it was just a dream, it did teach me a lot. Cause I just was really just letting go of the anger. I mean, the mind was kind of getting habituated to the practice a bit. So that's, that can come up in your dreams when, when you, when you practice a lot. So, uh, it's just, and that didn't end anger. I mean that, but it helped a lot, that kind of reflection. Um, and that, uh, you know, it's, and, but then there's always these, these curve balls that come up and you don't things you think, okay, no, today, no matter what, I'm not going to get angry today, no matter what I'm going to let go of everything. And then some curve ball would come like the one thing I can't let go of would happen or somebody would accuse me of something or say something or, you know, and, and it would just be like, you know, you got to be kidding me. With this. <laughs> and that's life. That's how life works. So, so it's like, uh, in the practice, it's, it's like a, an art. It's the art of, of practice. It's like spiritual Qigong. All these things are coming at us. And we're having to kind of <laughs> deal with them as they, as they arise. So, so it's a sort of a follow-up question for that. One is so strongly holding on to anger. You must somehow be very fond of that anger. 
Yeah, no, there's, that's the whole thing is there's something deep inside of us, which is telling us that it's the right thing to do, that it's actually going to solve the problem somehow, that it's actually going to bring us some sort of happiness. That's the delusion. So, so delusion is that which, um, we have a distorted perception. This is called Sanya Vipalasa. This is the distorted perception, which is telling us something's going to make us happy when it's actually not, it's actually lying to us. Yeah, it's 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 kind of mysterious. It's just it's these things are the are the reason we're we're in this existence, and um, it's it's habit. It's it's just something. It's the that's the very engine that drives samsara, that drives rebirth, that drives happiness and suffering. So, you know, you, and the reason that delusion is there too, is because there might get, there might be a point when it seems like anger makes us happy. There's an illusion, like, like we beat the guy up that we wanted to beat up and we feel like, yeah, I did it. And kind of like a, a brief moment of joy. And then, but then we have a whole lifetime of somebody wanting revenge and, you know, whatever. Uh, all the problems that so the Buddha called it anger with its poisoned root and honeyed honeyed tip, meaning there might be a little tiny bit of, but the law of kama, according to the Buddha, according to the Buddha, kama says that, and this is the exact nature of the Dhamma, what we call the Dhamma Niyamata, the uh, normality of the Dhamma is that, uh, and an intention based in anger can't result in happiness it's impossible like that that the actual vipaka the re, the result of that intention has to be suffering it, it can only be that way it can't be any other way and similarly like the result of like uh, greed which is more subtle than than anger um the the result can't be happiness so if it's if it's if we're experiencing happiness, that's the result of a, a skillful intention. It's not the result of anger. So it's come, but then kama is very very quick and and very subtle. So it's it's actually we're we're experiencing the results of past kama all the time, and creating new kama all the time. So the Buddha talked about things like generosity from a wholesome intention. You want to help, you want to help somebody, you want to see them benefited, you want to see them be happy, you want to offer a meal to somebody because they're hungry or whatever. There's that in the heart, like empathy. Uh, so that's very wholesome. So the result of that can't be suffering. So the result of that can only be happiness. So that's the, that's the uh, like exact nature of Kama um, is that, uh, but there's a time lag, so that's the unfortunate part. If if we were, if we received it immediately, nobody would do anything wrong. Nobody would hurt each other or get angry or take advantage of each other, and we'd be living in a celestial paradise. Um, but because there's this time lag, we don't we get confused. We don't we don't know. So it takes. That's why the practice it takes time to build up build up that momentum of wholesome mental states, then we'll start receiving the results of it. And then it goes from there. And then, then the faith really gets strong and then it gets really fun actually. And it's like, then it, then it's like, okay, this is, this actually, this actually works. This is pretty amazing. And the Buddha is, I knew the Buddha was great, but Buddha is even, even better than that. <laughs> so, uh, so the faith just, that's when it gets informed by wisdom and you start discernment or wisdom, what we call panya. That's when the heart sees automatically. We don't need to study the scriptures. Uh, that's when the heart sees automatically. So I, I just always use this one analogy because I think it's the best of the hand and the fire. So when the heart sees clearly what the causes of suffering are, it, it can only withdraw. It can't, it can't go in again. That's like putting your hand in a fire. When you know what a fire does your, to your hand, you see a fire there, you can't just, it's very difficult to even will yourself to put your hand in a fire because it, it's so painful. So 
when your hand is in a fire, um, say for some reason your hand is in a fire, you you don't think like, oh, let me check the manual. Let me check the instruction manual for what to do when my hand is in a fire. The hand just automatically retracts. So, so that's what it's like with when the heart starts to develop wisdom, when it really sees the suffering of anger. And then it, it will retract. It can't go into it anymore. Um, so it, but it, has to, it takes training. It has to be taught. See, the problem, though, here with this analogy is it's like, the, the heart is the hand that's always only knows the fire. It doesn't know anything else. It's never been out of the fire before. So that's, that's the kind of um, fun contemplation of like, what would it be like if the heart wasn't suffering? But the Buddha used some very strong terms. He said, it's, it's, the heart is on fire. It's, uh, you, need to, you need to get it out quickly. And um, it's, immense suffering. We don't even, we've been in suffering for so long, we don't really know how strong it is, how, how extreme the suffering, the nature of suffering actually is. So, so wanting to actually, that's, that's just spiritual practice. That's so the, on the ultimate level, Nibbana, which just means cooling, the uh, cooling of all those fires. <coughs> is, uh, that's, so the Buddha called spiritual practice is when we train the mind in stages to do this but then when if and this is a long-term project you know I'm not speaking from experience in this level here but like the Buddha saying if if the if the mind attains Nibbana or the the goal of practice then it's more spiritual than the spiritual so so like we want we want to be more spiritual but then the Buddha said well you can even take it further you can be more spiritual than the spiritual and um, that would be that would be Nibbana or the actual goal of practice. Um, and then it's, it's also good to contemplate what, what is, what is that? Like what would somebody experience like that? That's a very, the Buddha puts that out there as something desirable. One misunderstanding that can come up is that it's that, uh, an enlightened being or what we call an arhant doesn't feel anything, but it's ac actually the opposite. The arhant is is one who's always mindful, which what that means is they feel everything completely fully. So it's everything is felt completely fully. But they're, you know, having met um, some great senior monks myself, you could say like, oh, you know, a lot of them are just completely ordinary. You wouldn't think on just meeting them briefly that that they were special in any way until you live with them and you see that they follow the path of non-suffering and they, they don't suffer over anything and they never get angry and <laughs> just uh you you notice the unusual qualities kind of later if you live with someone for a long time um or they they are super humble they don't like go around saying hey i'm an arhant <laughs> uh, you, know, you bow to me or whatever and uh <laughs> so uh I digressed a little bit. Good. Ten fifty-five. Okay.